Richard, welcome back to the show. Um, Thank you. And finally on record. So it's <laughs> exciting. Like, let's share some of our conversation with um, whoever's listening. Both of them. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> well, today I'd like to riff on something that comes from our earlier discussion, Joe. And it's the difference between people and institutions and where the power lies and where the potential lies. Because much as I would like to think that all of the people, generally students and postdocs who believe open this and open that is so wonderful, the truth of the matter is nothing will happen in time to save our planet unless the institutions that both support them and don't support them, that fund them and don't fund them, do a pivot of substantial size, which means my focus is not so much on being around people who agree with me. It's understanding why the institutions that exist behave the way they do and to develop ways where they can improve their performance without undermining their persistence. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm just um, pausing so that you have a chance to intervene because otherwise I'll just keep talking. I keep um, talking because there's, there's already too much to digest to come up with a quick intervention. Well, Let's look at what the open movement is. In almost all cases, open is individuals saying, I demand this, I want this, this is the right thing to do. And the word should comes up an awful lot. It should be like this, it should be like that. And frankly, I have a lot of personal sympathy for with for that. It's it's really something that is is nice. If if instantly every piece of publicly funded scholarship was available to everyone in the world instantly in machine readable form at no cost, the moment it is published, wouldn't that be lovely? Yeah, it'd be really nice. And would anything change? My argument is no, not one thing. Mm -hmm. So people who say, oh, but think of all the researchers in Uganda that could now do the things they can't. No, they're not thinking about that. They're thinking about virtue signaling, how good it makes them feel that it's the right thing to do. Well, the right thing to do is to save our species and to save the planet and to restore a semblance of evidence-based democracy or a semblance of evidence-based progress uh, in building an energy culture that works. But that's the priority to me, not the other thing, because the other thing you can prove by doing the thought experiment, the Gedanken experiment, as it were, of saying, what happens if you succeed? Nothing, because the institutions that actually determine the effectiveness of outcomes from science are themselves unmoved by that. If you look at this, the funding agencies have enormous power, but do not in fact invest in science, they spend. What's the difference between investment and spending? Well, investment has a credible pathway to a return. Spending is just spending, like we would spend on something, on mm -hmm. new clothes, whatever, it's a spend, it's an expenditure. You don't expect a return on that investment. Investment is different. Now, when governments say we invest in climate interventions, do they really invest? Because private investors would never do it by just throwing money at a problem and saying, here, go fix it. It doesn't work like that. Imagine that Pfizer said, oh my God, we got COVID. So here, $3 billion to your R&D department, come back in two or three years and we'll see what you got. Doesn't work like that. What it does work with is to say, Here's the scope of the problem. Here's the acceptable price point. Here are the, the regulatory hurdles we have to overcome. Here are the manufacturing challenges. Here's the science challenges. All of those different things have to be solved to get an outcome, a new vaccine that works. Mm. Any one of them neglected, nothing works. So that institution has learned that investment means making sure that you've mitigated the risk of failure from all the different components before an outcome, a product that's sellable. And product isn't enough. It's got to be a product that achieves something so that it is recurring revenue. So take that not as a say saying that we have to be multinationals, but we can learn something from how companies work. And one of my uh, most influential friends in the open movement is a man named Jochai Benkler, who is one of the key intellectuals in the open source movement uh, as a professor at the Berkman Center at Harvard and before that New York University and Yale Law. Uh, he wrote some very influential pieces. The first of them that rocketed him to fame many years ago was called Kosa's Penguin or Linux and the Nature of the Firm. Yochai wrote this, Kos, C-O-A-S-E, Kosa's Penguin, was named after Ronald Kos, the remarkable Nobel laureate economist 
who wrote a very influential piece when he was still a student called The Nature of the Firm. Well, Yochai was riffing on that to say, and the penguin was the mascot, as it were, of the GNU Linux project that gave rise to the open source operating system that virtually all modern computing uses in various forms. So he was riffing on this in this substantial essay, Kosa's Penguin, or Linux and the Nature of the Firm. And that is really, really an important piece. But there was one fatal flaw. I tried so hard to extrapolate that logic that he had. And he's a lovely friend and a lovely man and very smart, very articulate. Um, the problem is open source or open collaborative work works when the incentives are aligned so that those who contribute are also those who benefit. If you contribute but don't benefit, it's, it's very, very challenging to get a critical mass. So in software engineering, the software engineers would use the software that they engineered. Go figure. And so what happens is that we've learned this virtue in open source of how wonderful it is to do that. And it turns out that in the real world where institutions rather than single individual actors control things, which is true of almost all science enabled innovation, um, it doesn't work that way because human motivations are diffused when they become part of tribes, which is what happens when you work with a company. If you work for the Max Planck Institute, you're part of the Max Planck Institute. If you work for a Toyota, you're part of Toyota. If you work for the Department of Energy, you're part of that. Each one of us is part of a tribal element and we assign ourselves to one or more tribes. And in so doing, we also diminish our role as a human being to whatever is acceptable within the limits of that tribal norm. So we can, we can complain a bit, but only a bit. And the issue is ultimately there are tribal norms that are ultimately dominant. And those tribal norms are not unimportant and they're not something just to make fun of. Part of them is about the propagation of capital. Now that's not a bad thing. How it's used currently is very bad, I think. But it's not a bad thing because the building up of capital is necessary to create things, whether it's a pyramid or a vaccine, whether it's a plant breeding technology or what have you. You need to have the potential energy, which is really what capital is. It's potential yeah. energy yeah. Yeah. to be able to do things, right? So the challenge is if you need to do things, and we do as a species, we need to change our behavior, to change our practices. We have to understand how that happens and how it doesn't. So using the logic of science to look at these issues with generosity of spirit, saying it may not be science that's the issue, but the tools of learning how to be a scientist can be very useful in this, is very valuable. So I look at this now and I say, how do we align the diverse institutions that have to work together to create a solution to anything ranging from low carbon, uh, low carbon energy through to regenerative soils to uh, public health outcomes that are accessible to all. Anything that has to do with social justice also has to do with challenging institutions to give a damn about that because they don't. In intrinsically, they really don't because institutions are pretty much about focusing capital and sometimes aggregating lots of capital. And as a general rule, poor people don't have much. Neither does the environment per se. So the classic market failure, the classic inability to find a small set of beneficiaries that can speak their mind with money doesn't work. We have to say, how do we build a constructive innovation system that understands the norms of these companies, these institutions, these agencies, and can do what we call social Aikido. The great Japanese martial art of Aikido is not about confrontation. It's about understanding momentum and redirecting it through a nuanced and precise uh, uh, intervention. You have in Aikido the ability to take a very powerful opponent and redirect them to being on their back behind you. And that happens with deep knowledge of the momentum and the tendencies and the behavior of that opponent. Well, the institutions right now in the world are basically a series of opponents, not because they're antithetical, they're soulless. Institutions don't have feelings. When someone says, Nike thinks this, no, they don't. Nike feels this, they certainly don't do that. Nike is a, a beast that does a particular thing. 
you can understand it. You can understand that there are some individuals that have some say in the company, but very few, especially if it's a publicly traded company, because then the, the shareholders are very, very powerful, but very diffuse. That means they can't exercise their moral judgment in any substantial way. The reason Patagonia did such a brilliant job recently in, in, in really making a powerful statement was because the brilliance and personal commitment of Yvon Chouinard and his family was all it took because they owned it. So that was an institution that was actually controlled by a human with still human values and human responsibilities and, and human decency to drive it. That's rare, very rare. The number of companies that are like that is tiny. And the sacrifices that most people have been made have made to get in those powerful positions are Faustian. They are dark. They are corrupting of the moral imperative that Yvon Chouinard kept close to his heart his whole life. He's a person I admire enormously since I met him first when I was a you know 18-year-old rock climber in Southern California, meeting him when he was still making pitons out of his you know Great Pacific Ironworks. He's an enormously interesting man. And he did an interesting thing. That should not be viewed as the norm. That's an exception. We have to face the fact that the vast majority of government agencies, captured civil society, uh, private sector institutions, and public sector institutions, such as universities, are all themselves not people. They are entities that are different from people. They have norms. They have practices. They have constraints. They have incentives. If we need to change how they work together to get outcomes, new practices for society, new products that lead you to new practices, we must be practical. We must look at it and we must say what must be done to change this juggernaut. That's where scientific thinking can be very powerful, but it has to abandon the discipline from whence it came. The big problem is if I'm a molecular biologist, which I guess I was, this isn't about molecular biology. This is about thinking. Mm -hmm. This is about thinking as a human being, but as a practical person. How do we make good things happen by understanding the forces that are that are around us? It's not about revolution because the the outcome after revolution is filling of a vacuum with more mm -hmm. uh, self-serving. We have to figure out how to do this. We don't have any time not to. So I look at the open movement as actually being in some ways kind of silly. I mean, it's about personal ethics of wouldn't it be good to share, but wouldn't it all even be better to have a planet we could share on? Wouldn't it be better to have a society that's not intrinsically grotesquely unjust? Of course it would. So then let's take the same energy and enthusiasm we seem to have about open access or open data or open science and apply it to open for outcomes for a society that isn't like us, for people that don't have voices and privilege. Let's not talk about, you know, more and better science. That's not the limit to what we need right now. The limit is coordination of actors that are different from us. Mm -hmm. That means we have to understand and respect their norms and try to make it possible for them to behave differently without yielding to punishment. They need the ability to behave in a prosperous, decent way within their norms and be better at impact at coordinating. So the biggest target in my view is what's called rent in economic senses. So let me backtrack a minute and give a little micro lesson in economics, uh, riffing on Ronald Coase. Now, Ronald Coase wrote this influential piece, which is incredibly challenging to read because it's, because to be honest, it's really poorly written, uh, mm -hmm. at least for the layperson. He wrote this piece, The Nature of the Firm, back when he was, a, I think, an undergraduate in, in the UK. He later on won the Nobel Prize 35, 40 years later at probably University of Chicago, because that seems to be where they are. Um, but he was a UK undergraduate or graduate student, and he wrote this piece, The Nature of the Firm. And he asked a really simple and obvious question. Why do we have companies? Really, why do we have companies? Because the theory of economics was that independent actors would self-select based on market forces and signals, and they would listen to market signals and provide services, and therefore they would self-assemble into the most efficient modality to deliver an outcome. Yeah. And that was the, the premise that drove economics. But of course, it's completely wrong. We have companies, firms, as he called them, and that includes government agencies. We have institutions which exist specifically to coordinate 
the diverse contributions necessary to make an outcome. So Ford Motor Company has a department of research. It has a department of intellectual property, has a department of manufacturing and regulatory compliance and all of these different things. Each one filled with people who have mastered that guild craft. Each one sure that they're the center of the universe until they realize they can't get paid unless they make a car that sells. So they are forced together into a room, uh, even though they have different cultures, the regulatory culture, the manufacturing culture, and the research culture are really quite different. And the norms are different, and the guilds are different, the rewards are different, except they all have to work together to make a car that sells. Mm -hmm. So they're forced together, as it were, in the boardroom or in the room in which the executive vice president allocates resources based on inputs from all these different gurus, all these different guild masters. Now that happens because in common pursuit of a paycheck, you can break down the guild barriers so they have to coordinate their activity. Because if they don't, there are no cars. They cannot sell cars. They lose everything. The company goes down because they cannot make and sell cars. So they are forced to coordinate. And they're forced to coordinate in response to a market signal where they say, oh, if we sell a car at this price point that does this and has pretty blue fenders and does X, Y, and Z, we'll make a matzah, a lot of money. And therefore, we'll all benefit and we'll be okay. So that's why we have companies. So they can coordinate uh, the capabilities necessary to make a thing, a product, or a practice for that matter. So do we have that in the public sector? Do we have that in commons failures? Absolutely not. Every government that spends money on science does not invest in outcomes. They spend on science. That's like Ford pouring all their money into the research department, never asking whether it could be manufactured, never asking whether it would be regulatorily compliant, but never asking how you could possibly achieve it if someone else has the intellectual property. So that's stupid. And yet that's how every government behaves. There's one area where they basically fund, and that's science, just hoping that good things happen. In my experience, the good thing happens by publishing it, at which point market forces reassert themselves. Companies look for stuff that's basically free out there. It's open. You, know, you can learn from it. And then they turn it into products in response to market signals with all the expense still being coordinating all the different actors. So here's the problem. The environment doesn't exert a market signal. By its very definition, it's a failure of the commons, which means the market is diffuse. It is limited in the huge number of beneficiaries, very few specific beneficiaries. So you don't get financial market signals. So the system we have for doing science, publishing it, and hoping that good things happen works fine. When a company or companies or many companies can use that to make a product in response to market signals, there's nothing operatively wrong with that. But there is something hugely missing in that calculus, and that is failures of the commons, which is the environment, which is public health, which is dismissive of poor people, which is colonialism. Almost everything you can think of that causes the demise of the planet that we're in right now, both in democracy and an ecosystem, is because of failures of the commons, which means we have to now reboot the system, looking hard at the institutional collaboration and cooperation that must happen, and not by wishing it so, but by understanding the limits to its happening and to overcome those limits. So our focus at Cambia and at the Lens is to be quite practical. We look at how companies work, how governments work, how institutions work, and we're not focused on a very few vocal people who say, open this, open that, and bleat at us. We like them, they're our friends, but are they going to somehow get together in a circle and sing kumbaya and make things change? No, they're institutions. As soon as they get an offer to publish in nature, they'll publish in nature. They'll, they won't publish in PLOS, they'll publish in nature. 99 times out of 100, there will be the odd exception. And so the issue is institutional convergence or inertia is dominant in a genetic sense. It's epistatic to personal wishes in most cases. There will always be outliers and they're wonderful, but they don't get much done. So what we have to do is understand how we coordinate different institutions to create outcomes for the commons. That requires a generosity of spirit that most people in the scientific arena don't have the luxury to exercise because, in fact, they are institutionalized. Science is not just a process anymore. It's a profession. 
And as a profession, there's a guild, and the guild has rules and norms. Some of the guild norms are quality control, but most are not. So anyway, I should take a sip of my scotch now and let you talk for a bit. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. Lots of food for thought. I, I would like to intervene to ask, how do you see, like, when I, when I was a grad student, I thought there's two categories of researchers. The basic researchers who are there to explore, which I also found myself um, in the community, and then the applied researchers who do sort of already have a mandate towards product development. Like how, like we're exploring something, we're at the edge of knowledge, we're trying to learn systems um, to eventually make that applicable to industry, to the social sectors, to medicine, whatever. Um, whereas the basic researchers, and this is also why Germany, when was that? Uh, I think after the Second World War, 10, 15 years later, they figured we have to invest massive amounts of money into basic research, hence the Max Planck Society, which of course also has a pre-war history. Um, and Petro So basically, how do you... Is, do you see a reasoning in having these two categories of researchers and not they also have uh, like their position in the ecosystem for those who are just there to do research and the word just not um, being understood as a qualifier, but you know, to, to be able to specialize in research and let others do the thinking and the implementing and how the acquired knowledge can be utilized. Okay, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Do you agree we're in an existential crisis? Oh, yes, right? sure. Yeah, okay. and this was also recently. So in the light of climate change, of course, I was also asking myself, do we have the luxury to continue asking, like, oh, I want to learn, like, this is really a prestige or ign ignorant situation, really, unless, and then there's also so much research that has already been done, which is ignored because scientists only deem relevant what has been published in the last 10, 15 years, or even four or five years. And I think before that is outdated and it's not because it's valid. Absolutely, that's a brilliant oh. point to raise. The issue of surfacing and repurposing old knowledge, the issue of mining and recombining old knowledge is the key to solving problems. That's There's awesome. often very little intellectual property blocking it. There is just a normative dislike of something for which you cannot claim credit. The profession of science is built around credit and credit is based around novelty. That's why competition for being first is far more powerful than any competition for being best. Because it's not true that really thoughtful science wins out, quick science wins out, quick, cutting edge, fashionable science. So what makes it fashionable is peer adherence to a particular norm. So you're exactly right. The question is, do we have that luxury? Absolutely not. Of course we don't. And so what, in fact, do we have? We have a cadre of millions of people learning how to think, but not learning what to think about. And... The point is, it's a luxury. It is a beyond a luxury that taxpayers are just giving money to people who view it as their divine right of gods to explore on whatever field they want to do. It's wonderful. Great work if you can get it. I talk to builders, to bricklayers, to plumbers, to electricians. Tell them about how tough it is to be a scientist, where you get your money up front to ask the questions you want to ask. And they're thinking, what the heck? If I don't build pipes that don't leak. If I don't make a building that doesn't fall over, I get nothing. I don't get it up front. I don't have the luxury. Almost no one in life has the luxury that scientists do to explore for the betterment of humankind. If you think for a millisecond that it was about exploring for the betterment of humankind, you really have to get more cluey about things because the truth is it's a system that was developed to propagate power. As these people explore all these new things, some of those new things are utilizable by those who already have coordination over the other elements. Mm -hmm. If you need to coordinate six bridge pylons to make a bridge, and one of them is not yet coordinated, but it's free and open science, and you can use that to build the rest of your bridge, you capture what is basically 
dewy-eyed, oh, I'm exploring the unknown. Sure you are. And you have to ask who is able to capture that and turn it into money. And if they turn it into money, is it a bad thing? Not necessarily. If they turn it into monopolistic pricing and exclusionary practices, absolutely, it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So do these people consider that? No, which means they're tantamount to contributors or collaborators, as we would have said back in the, in the bad old days in Europe. They are Vichy. They are the Vichy scientists who decide to be collaborators because it's so convenient not to have the downside. Mm -hmm. And that's a very serious accusation, but it's true. It's wonderful. It's joyous. You know, discovering new things is such a treat. But to be allowed to do that in a, gov in a, in a culture that has no existential crises is logically beautiful. I like it. But to do it without the knowledge of who captures it where it goes, how it's manipulated to assure monopoly pricing, to drive competition out, to not make a decent and ethical world, that also should be clear. So if there's one thing I would come back to with regard to openness, Joe, it's openness of the landscape on which science occurs, to understand how it is captured, controlled, or limited, or not delivered to society and why. If this landscape is understood, if this innovation cartography is clear and open, people of all different ex expertises, from marketing to regulatory compliance to intellectual property to science to investment, can get together and build landscapes of what is known about that field. And then investors and practitioners can look at that landscape and say, oh my goodness, if I keep pouring money into this, the only company that can use it is company X, and they have no track record of delivering to impoverished people. Of course they don't. What a surprise. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, I invest in an alternative pathway for ad adoption of this science, we could actually drive monopoly prices down, get more effective delivery of outcomes to people we care about or to causes that are important to us. So innovation cartography is about mapping the domains in which we seek outcomes, we seek progress. Now, obviously, it's comparatively difficult to harness um, at astrophysics for, for financial gain. There are people who try, but it's not easy. Whereas in, in biological sciences, in medicine, in agriculture, especially medicine, it's trivial. It's in, the build, it's, in the, it's in the DNA of it, as it is in engineering and chemistry, and even to some extent in physics as it, as it stands. The challenge is, can we create open, additive, curated, expert canvases or landscapes that talk about who are the actors, who could potentially benefit, cui bono, as they say in Latin, and who benefits? And can we say, we want a different community to benefit, so let's ask what is necessary to ensure that is taken care of. Now, does that mean Workers of the World Unite, let's publish it open access? No, of course it doesn't. It means vastly more sophisticated determinations than that. I failed the community when I invented a technology which enabled plant genetic engineering. I, I provided it before publication, before patenting, open access to everybody, everybody, ranging from companies to government institutions to private individuals. And the outcome of that was domination of the world of industrial agriculture by one company that was ready to use it and knew how to use it, whereas all the rest hadn't a clue. So what happens is, you know the old expression, chance favors a prepared mind? Well, in this case, science favors the prepared company. A company or an institution that understands how to coordinate the different actors, you get outcomes and they control those outcomes. In that particular case, it was not the end of civilization. They were not a horrible company, but they didn't do the things I wanted to see done. And they weren't expected to really. Mm -hmm. But the things I wanted to see done, I wanted to see thousands of active companies around the world developing locally relevant agricultural technologies developed based on the local circumstances and users and the local environments. None of that happened because nobody understood you had to get ready. You had to prepare the ground. Just like you do when you plant seeds, you you can't just yeah. assume you just throw seeds out and you get crops. It's hard work. Making things is hard. And scientists and scientific funding institutions have to grow up and recognize that that hardness, the difficulty in making things is the point of intervention that we need for commons challenges such as the climate, global health, 
regenerative agriculture, all of these challenges are because of a failure of the commons, because of a failure of imagination. We need to build these critical evidentiary commons maps called innovation maps, cartographs, so people have to see and institutions can see and act upon that in their best interest. So my sense is that for everything we've been doing for what used to be the patent lens and now has been the lens for the last decade is about creating evidence bases for institutions to behave better for their particular mandate or their particular imperative. Now, big companies don't care really how they get big and stay big. They care about getting big and staying big. So if you can provide a way where a large company can behave better with less monopolistic practices, with more constructive income outcome, outcomes, sorry, then that's not a bad solution. It's not the only solution, but it's not bad. Mm -hmm. So if you look at what some companies have done in developing batteries or solar panels or whatever else, it does take scale and it takes a lot of capital. If we can do that where they're more effective without being monopolistic, that's not a bad outcome. But it's not the only one. There's countless local scale outcomes we can aspire to and enable. But that means we have to be sophisticated. And the open X crowd is not very sophisticated. They're ideologically um, driven. And I like ideology. I have an ideology. And the ideology is decency and inclusion. Mm. Uh, but not inclusion just of scientists reading stuff. How many you work a lot in Africa, Joe? You would appreciate this. One of my one of my dearest friends is a public health professor who founded and ran an HIV research center at the University of Western Cape and is now a professor in Canada. And she talks about the fear of open access amongst scholars in the developing world, where if you wanted to publish a nature paper in the past, of course, non-open access, it was a good enough paper. You could publish it. It wouldn't cost you a thing. Now, it costs you 11000 12000 to publish it open access. And with the imperative the mandates, it's going to be essential. So the point is, it's it's not a trivial issue to say this is good and that is bad. Mm -hmm. What you can say is what outcome you want, and then to trace it back to what are the limits, what are the blockings, what are the enablers to that outcome. So that's the powerful approach. Openness, from my perspective, is open to outcomes. Open to outcomes so that you can actually say, what's blocking this for being a more effective tool for social advancement? for ecosystem resilience, because that's where scientific thinking is useful. Yeah. And you know, scientists basically do the most embarrassing thing. They underestimate the power of the craft that they've learned in thinking. They underestimate it as realizing that it's not genera you know, generalizable to many different fields, and it is. So having good scientists become politicians or becoming regulators or becoming communicators or becoming industrial mavens. That's a good thing because mm -hmm. the craft of learning how to think is a critical craft. But it's not unique to scientists. The best can, the best builders I know are incredible at problem solving and at thinking and generalizing. So scientists have to be a little bit less arrogant uh, and more. Uh, I think scientists are, some are arrogant, I agree from what I've seen. And I think most are introvert and shy and don't dare to step into their purpose. Like what really disturbs me when I teach anything, scientific writing, data management, whatever, and I ask first, second, third year graduate students, why are we talking about scientific writing here? And then the answer of all I often get is, well, I have to, pub I have to publish to graduate. I was like, really? Is this why I see you're in this course? Like, is it mm. not that you want to contribute to what others have done and add to it and share that with a wider community, potentially other <laughs> stakeholders outside academia to have a positive impact on this bloody bleeding, actually, planet or society, which is also bleeding. <laughs> and it's like, and when I ask them, like, well, what, sure, what going to be no. a, they forget. Sure, no. Because they have to do that to survive within the, the guild. Yeah, and it's so sad because first year PhD students, they still vividly know, like, I came here to save the world. I came here to find a treatment for that disease. I came here to, and then they're being dismantled of their values. No, no, actually, 
The challenge is, yeah, I mean, yes and no. Yes, they are dismantled of their values, but it's not that exactly. We are tribal people. Human beings are tribal. We seek a tribe. And tribes have rules. That's why tribes exist. A mm -hmm. tribe will say, you do this, you don't do that. These are the norms. Yeah, this is how it's thing in, in its essence. They are joining a tribe. It's what? It's not necessarily bad. I mean, we are social animals. We need our tribe to... Well, you say it's not necessarily bad. Yeah, but it's not necessarily anything. It's just what it is. Uh -huh. We don't have to put a, we don't have to put a judgment call on it. But we can say that's what it is. And so what we see is when people are still just people, they can express all sorts of things. But if you need things from them, they need the resources of the tribe. Mm -hmm. And the resources of the tribe include a laboratory, research funding, colleagues, process that insulates them from the downside, i.e. they have a job that continues for a year or two, or God forbid, tenure. The point is, these people sacrifice always some element of their personal um wanderlust intellectual or emotional wanderlust mm -hmm. for tribal adherence oh, okay. of course they, no. but that's not it's not worth saying whether it's good or bad it is what it is mm -hmm. we have to however realize that that's why i'm interested in institutional reform not in talking to people especially grad students and postdocs because there's nothing that breaks them up worse than hearing how their dreams of doing good things are dashed that's not going to help no, so, I'm telling them, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, getting a bunch of students to listen to me in an undergraduate lecture course, oh, Dr. Jefferson, what an inspirational, wonderful thing. I want to be just like you when you grow up. And and I think, no, no, you don't. I'm bitter and yeah. twisted and frustrated. You don't want that. What you do want is to be in an institution that has some degree of coherence with your views. That is more a sense of what we do with institutions than it is with those people. We can't change the people, but institutions are a fairly new phenomenon in the last 10, 20,000 years. And that means we can have oversight on them. And the fact that we have governments, at least a few of us are lucky enough to still have democratic governments, but they might be gone in another month or two or some of them. But as long as we do, we really have an opportunity to do it right. That is to look at the points of intervention we need. So the reason the lens is talking to big publishers isn't because we're thinking they are the solution, but they are definitely an institution that is in a critical pivot point. Mm -hmm. They have the ear of funders. They have the ear of institutions. They have the prestige, deserve it or not, of being that particular publisher. So if we make common cause with them because they smell that they're, um, they're not silly or stupid people, by and large, they are aware that the world of publishing has a limited shelf life. Now they could squeeze these margins out of it for another decade or two, but after that, no. But when the fact that you're making your money on science on one side to publish the science, you need to actually listen to that side of the business to inform your business model. So that's what we're trying to do talking to publishers is get them to decrease what's called the Chinese walls between the business and the science. So the scientists, the editorial staff who get some of these things can actually have a bigger say in the business decisions because otherwise we've got no planet in 15, 20 years. We just don't. So it's critical that the open community, it's not a community, it's a its a bag of rats. And you know, one of the things that I really think that is really frustrating is how making common cause works when you're not resource limited. But watch what foundations have done to those of us who build infrastructure for the open movement, us, open Alex, this, 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 that. All these institutions are scrabbling for survival because in foundations and governments say, well, you have to become sustainable, meaning you have to be thrust out into a competitive world where instead of making common cause, you are forced to compete with each other and ensure that it's a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. It is despicable behavior by foundations, which of all institutions should be free to make visionary long-term investments, but they do not because they are driven by norms. They're driven by the norms of not putting your head up over the parapet and having it shot off. So program officers and foundations will not take a chance and will, in fact, executives. No, not really, because they have founders and they have boards. So the problem is institutions that should say, gosh, we need a public solution. You look at an example that I admire greatly. Uh, a good friend of mine, David Lippman, founded PubMed. He founded the NCBI. 
30 years ago, um, built PubMed from scratch and PubCam and everything else with a remarkably un-American mandate, which is do not be parochial. So the bandwidth from North Korea and North Carolina are the same. They do not say, where are you from? We're going to keep you out. It's for everybody. Mm -hmm. It was the prototype of a true enabling open infrastructure, PubMed, professionally curated, universally available, highly performant, and driven largely because he had the personality, the pugnacious personality and the vision to assemble a remarkable team of, of phenomenal craftspeople and, and other leaders. So it's not just him anymore. He left a few years ago. But the number of people that have been able to keep it going is substantial. But why? It's on the whim every single year. It's on the whim of the budget, the United States budgeting process. It doesn't have multi-year funding guaranteed. It could stop in a year. But through force of will, they've been able to make sure that it continues. Mm -hmm. Is it vulnerable? Yes. All open projects are unless they make money, which is deeply frustrating. Mm -hmm. And for those of us that are trying to create an infrastructure on which you can build, it has to be open data. It has to be or else it is exclusionary and you can't build on it. So it's a big challenge for us. And it's part of our institutional maturation that we understand the foundations are just not going to be bold. By and large, there may be foundations that can, but generally if so, they're because the founder is still there and they're not staggeringly wealthy to be surrounded by people that tell them they're right. Because billionaires generally associate themselves with people that tell them what wonderful people they are, how smart they are, how uniquely they deserve to be billionaires. But people that might only have $100 million, hey, in Silicon Valley, that's, you know, that's down market. But they probably don't have enough money to surround themselves by sycophants that tell them they're the that they're the, the world's gift to science. So maybe those are the target. People that are still people, not industrialized uh, foundations, who say, yeah, this is important. We put $10 million, $20 million into this. And it'll last for five or 10 years. That's enough time. Maybe so. That's what we need maybe is someone that is still a human being, that still has the imperatives of a human being, not yet tribally integrated, that is not surrounded by sycophantic yes men and women, who tell them that they're the, the end of civilization as we know it, they're so wonderful. And maybe they'll have courage because the truly rich have no courage. Yeah. Um, I have like five or so questions to ask. Um, so much for um, grounds for discussion. So do you think what's missing in the equation is back in the days i was working in kenya at unep environment program um and like western societies seem to see money and capital as the one and only thing to acquire as in the workforce or as a firm as a company and more of it but isn't it that nature not the publisher, the around the... <laughs> that. As but... I say, the phenomenon, not the journal. Yeah. <laughs> um, like value or intrinsic value and not like with value, I mean, like value should not only be, or is not only in money, but what keeps us alive. And that's what the ecosystem teaches us day in and day out, like to appreciate beauty all around us with its imperfections, but also, so how can we, do we have to capitalize? Okay, what I, what I learned at UNAP is that for, for capitalism, a dead tree is capital because it can sell it as furniture. Where actually the living tree is capturing carbon and allows us to continue living on this planet. Well, not one tree alone, but the whole forest and many of yeah. yeah, this is but, but why, why did we go wrong, like as a Western society? And as much as I also work with and have worked with indigenous communities who still today, I mean, even if they're not physically capable anymore, but they so deeply, and it's not a belief really, it's proven fact that we need our livelihoods, we need our ecosystem to survive on this very planet. So why is Western society 
as a whole. Okay, okay. You, you really are asking that question, not just expressing your frustration that it is so, but asking the I don't question. Know both, but like from a systematic viewpoint, which you are very much capable of, like where, how can we fix this? Another okay. question would that's, be- That's what I will talk to you about. So that's what I'll talk to you about in an hour. Okay. But what I'll first do is, is try to unpack some of the unfortunate verbiage. Western society. I mean, basically, China is as capitalistic as anything as is India. So is that Western? No. Is it Western? Yes. Uh, so don't say Western society does this. Look at, at Eastern wisdom and medicine. When I've been working 20, 30, 40 working visits in China and India, and you see the complete and total corruption of systems there, even from the old days, from 2000 years ago, it's not about Western. We okay. like to do that because it's, it's a pillory. Well, that's we can look at centric I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, cultures that monetize, uh, that extrapolate value into an exchangeable, fungible form, uh, are vulnerable to this because you can accumulate it. You can acclaim, accumulate that fungibility. I mean, once you have have exchangeable capital as opposed to enduring capital, you can exchange it and, and aggregate it. So. The answer to how we solve it, I'll deal in my next hour discussion through hologenome theory and the marrow biont hypothesis, which mm -hmm. I think is very useful in framing this issue. But the truth is, we have to, first of all, stop romanticizing about these things. When you say talking about working with UNEP, when I started working for the United Nations in 1989 as the first molecular biologist in the UN system, um, I had dewy-eyed ideas that the international system was was really doing all the right things. And in fact, it's just another institution. Everybody advancing themselves to get to the commissary just before Christmas to get the tax-free Mercedes and everything else. Is it a necessary instrument? Yes. Is it a particularly good instrument? No. Uh, and putting it on a, I, I did this 35, 40 years ago. I put it on this, this pedestal and thought, oh, how good that I work for the UN now. And I discovered very quickly that the way you ensure propagation of an institution is you mitigate risk. So every institution on earth exists to ensure it exists. So if you look at the United Nations, it exists not because it seeks creative outcomes, but because it mitigates against any risk to its inst institutional persistence. The same is true for corporations, the same is true for government agencies. It's no different there. There are well-intentioned people working within the system, and that's a great thing. There are really good people in there, and that's a great thing. And the verbiage is good. The actual engagement with the actors that are in the way of seeing a good outcome is very poor. The UN system, as a general rule, does not deal well with the private sector. And yet every product you ever taste, eat, touch, um, see in your life comes through business. Everything. If you look around your house right now, every single thing you see and touch has come from business, everything, 100%. None of it ranging from a nectarine you might have through to uh, your dog's collar to what have you has come through business. And yet there's this mystical idea that, oh, we're gonna talk about Workers of the World United and not talk about why business behaves particular ways. Looking back at Ronald Coase and many other thoughtful economists, there are insights into how business works and how it doesn't. If we understand those practically, we can make interventions, but only if the tribe we're in allows interventions. As a general rule, when I became a social entrepreneur, I discovered a new tribe. I made, I made a talk at, in Oxford at, this, at the Skoll Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, their annual meeting, that is still generally one of my best, other than a couple of craven comments I made about the Rockefeller Foundation, because I was so desperate for funding. Other than that, it's a really, really good talk. And I talk about how I discovered in the social entrepreneur world that I finally had a tribe. I'd been excised from the tribe or excised myself from the tribe of science. And then I excised myself from the tribe of, of, of international development, which is itself a pejorative in my word. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a tribe. And then I found social enterprise and I discovered I had a tribe. And the way I framed it in that talk, which you might want to take a look at, it's not very long. Um, and it, it's the origins of the talker and Jane Goodall. And that's another thing I'll come to in the next hour. And why Jane Goodall described the origins of the problem we're in and the origins of the solution. Um, but in that, I also described how most of the members of my tribe don't understand what I do, but they're glad that I do it. Because they there was a trust component that 
you're vigorously pursuing decency. And that's why social entrepreneurship, it has been corrupted in the last decade or two by people thinking they want to get rich by doing good. And generally, it's been dominated by young people who have no life experience whatsoever, or failure or anything else. And so it's very fashionable to be a social entrepreneur, man. You know, I'm going to make like water and bottles made out of recycled like cardboard. And it's going to be like really good. And I'm going to make a lot of money. You know, Jesus, there's, there's such insipid dicks. And the, the real social entrepreneurs are the ones that have spent 30, 40 years learning the hard yards of working with people to identify issues and solve them. But most don't solve systemic problems. Everybody in social enterprise talks about, oh, we're making systemic interventions. But what they're doing is creating solutions that work in a dysfunctional system. So they're not changing the system. They're figuring out incredibly creative ways to make certain services happen in a dysfunctional system. What we're doing is pulling the lens a little farther back and saying, what makes the system dysfunctional? Can we intervene in social Aikido in these systems? Can we use changes in modern data practices, modern intellectual property and scientific methodology? A lot of interesting stuff. Can we make changes in the intrinsically dysfunctional system? Are we going to be nibbling around the edges while we go to hell? And I don't want to do that. I don't have time or interest in that. Um, we have to make the system change through social Aikido, but we have to understand it. Just as practitioners of Aikido cannot do it by just learning by rote, they have to understand deeply and profoundly the intention and momentum of the element they want to change. I won't even call it an opponent because they do not call it that. It is an element that must be redirected. That's what we have. We have institutional inertia it keeps us going in a particular way. Is it, as you asked, does it have to be this way? No, it doesn't. But it is that way because we understand something about tribal norms and reinforcement of those. Can we use democratic governance to oversight and improve that? Absolutely. The reason we have companies is because we have allowed that to happen through government. Government gives the right to form a company. A company is intrinsically a limited liability entity where the people in the company are exempted from a downside risk from the company. That's what companies are. Mm -hmm. They're liability limitations. Now, liability is also morals. So the intrinsic de development of the company excises the imperative of the human being from the, the expression of the entity, the institution. Because you're insulated from that. There's no downside risk. If you're a director and you behave reasonably okay or a shareholder in a company, you don't typically have much liability if the company doesn't do the right thing. If it does it because of bad governance, then yes, it can come back to haunt you. But generally, as long as you go through the right movements, if the company, you know, assets strips this country or that country or whatever else, and it's doing it to make profits and the shareholders are happy, it's okay. It's legal. That's something we can work with. We can work as Yvonne Chouinard did with Patagonia, developing a public benefit company that still made gobs of money by doing the right thing. It's possible when you don't excise the human from the mm -hmm. institution, or at least you don't structurally excise them. But instead of saying what would be nice, we can say, what is it now? How do we work with these entities now? All of them are risk averse. Can we make it lower risk for them to take different steps? Yes, we can. All of them are outcome positive. Can we expose new opportunities for them? Yes, we can. All of them are insufficient unto themselves. They all need partners. Can we expose the right partnerships? Yes, we can. All of them face that this will take time, and that means it has to change on a daily basis. They need to map trajectories to get to an outcome. Can we help? Yes, we can do this. That's called port mapping. Partnerships, opportunities, risks, and trajectories. If we can illuminate these using open data, and using expert curation, we can decrease the resistance to change because of risk mitigation. We can increase the enthusiasm to change because of new opportunities. We can diminish the internal revenue requirement by finding the right partnerships that have common cause and become sticky partners by existing in a trajectory that exists for a long time. It will change one year to the next as new actors come in, as new technologies emerge, as new markets collapse or expand. We have to make this a dynamic map. It's not a static thing, a PDF, it's a process. If we can make those maps a matter of public record, which can then be internalized in a company in their own norms and make confidential, that's okay. It's not, it's not bad, it's just what they do. 
they can take a different set of decisions. Their risks will be more clear. Their opportunities will be more attractive. Their partnerships will be more powerful and the trajectories will be more nimble. All of these things lend themselves to a trajectory for change. So our version can be formed from the word change in Latin, cambia. And it has changed itself many times over 35 years to realize that the experiments we did initially didn't work. The experiments we did after that didn't work. And we keep getting better and better and better. And I think we're a little closer to an effective intervention now. It'll still take time to do, and I hope to pass the torch to other entities to do this. But part of it is talking on podcasts like this, where if we can light the fire under people from a different demographic than me, that is not a 66 and a half year old white male, but rather somebody who's got more miles on the, on the clock still, we can actually pass the sophistication of this port mapping, of dealing with, not with science, but science and technology and problem solving. Inclusive isn't just a matter of saying, you know, oh, well, we want all sorts of poor people to have a voice in this. Yeah, but we have to accept the fact that everything in society works by proxies. And nothing is a matter of just everybody get together and say something nice. It's a matter of making progress now. That may not be a matter of being the perfect. And if I have one lesson, it's, I'm not going to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We have no choice but to make substantial change in the next 10 to 15 years. Will it be perfect? Absolutely not. Will it be good? Absolutely. So the choice is either aspire to the perfect and congratulate yourself and surround yourself by others who will drink red wine with you and tell you what a wonderful person you or they are, or you get to work and you make the good happen in spite of the perfect not being attainable in the short term. Mm -hmm. So that's where I kind of want to leave it right now um, and pick it up on the next time because you asked, and how do we do this? And I'd love to talk about two elements of that in the next podcast. One is the scientific basis for society, meaning why is humankind and our institutions the way it is? And I have, I think, a unique insight into this with something I developed 30 years ago called the Whole Genome Theory of Evolution, which has been borne out very, very many times in the last decade, because you and I, if I were to look at you, what I see is the large thing that's in the scale that I can envision with my eyes. And that's a scaffold populated by the majority of your genetics, which is microbial. So you are mostly microbes, Joe, not just you in particular, most people, in fact, all people are, <laughs> as are all dogs, as are all rice plants, as are all, um, almost everything. They're mostly microbes, but we can't see them because they're below the, the visual threshold that we have. Rather like Newton, absolutely right. In a cricket game, you only need Newton's laws, but in a galactic scale, Newton is absolutely not right. You need to have post-Newtonian physics. The post-Darwinian biology is about the whole genome. And the terathelium, which is what I define as the earth, is actually the genetic field from which all of us draw the components that make us an intact entity. It's not about us. In fact, it's about them. We are a scaffold that allows them to transiently populate us to advance their aims. So rethinking evolution also allows you to look at the power of recruiting generativity, which is the ability to, to generate or to make new functionality. So microbes and microbial populations have generativity. They do things. They have biochemical pathways for making this kind of polymer or meta metabolizing this or doing that. They are recruited to a scaffold, which is a rice plant, which is a moss, which is you, which is your dog, to do stuff in the aggregate. But it's not about us. It's about the terathelium bringing us to the table. And the question is, if we look at everything through the lens of scale bias, of the big things we see living in the time frame we understand, then we will not get a full picture of life. If, on the other hand, we start looking at it the other way, this is not like Gaia, which is sort of vague and, oh, it's all you know, like Gaia. Uh, this is a mechanism. This is a scientifically testable mechanism by which living entities are largely amalgam of a huge complex polydispersed population of microbes and a scaffold. We used to think the scaffold was the works, that I was Richard Jefferson, I was the Protestant, you know, the product of Hermeline and Carl Jefferson. And, and that's true-ish. But the majority of me is microbial, some of it inherited from my parents and their environment, the rest of it from the rest of the environment. Humans, however, have done something really twisted and Byzantine. In the billion year of evolution that has 
taken the terathelium and populated on other scaffolds, it's only been in the last hundredth of a percent that we've had humankind. And what has humankind done? It's learned how to be sessile. It's learned how to be sedentary. That means it can stay in one place year after year. Instead of moving around uh, or being heterodispersed in its populations, it is now a highly concentrated entity. And what does that mean? And this is where I'm going to leave a little teaser for the next podcast. Mm -hmm. It means you shit where you eat, which means that if most of the microbes are in your intestine and you poo where you live, that changes the founder population of the terathelium of the earth from which you sample the microbes. And it dramatically changes and makes inbred uh, the population of microbes that make us who we are. So we have, by the very use of our brains, mastered salt and fire to, to make meat last. And that started the sedentary population structure, followed immediately by animal and plant husbandry, i.e. agriculture, which allowed us to do it even more profoundly, which allowed us to shit where we eat, which meant we have created the disaster of an inbred phylogenome, which I call the marrow biont. We are not, in fact, evolutionarily sophisticated. We're evolutionarily corrupted entities because of our brains. We learned to be sedentary. We built huge populations because we could do that, but at the cost of having a resilient, heterodisperse, and diverse microbial population. We have massive holes in our genetic capability as people, as livestock. We have holes. Those holes are called disease. They're a lack of functionality. So most of the problems we face, both socially, economically, and in terms of health, are associated, in my view, with the demise of the hologenome and the, and the emergence of a marrow genome, which is an inadequate, impart, um, partial um, population of the true microbial capabilities that we should be harnessing. So the metaphor for this and how it affects our view of society is extremely valuable to me. It forms a mechanistic underpinning for looking at social function and dysfunction and saying, what would be the optimum behavior in a, in a wild situation that is not associated with, with sedentary life of civilization? What do you find is the free associ association, the free transfer of generatives between one entity and another. Okay, if, if a wild animal is, is proceeding around, they defecate all over the place and other animals in, ingest that stuff, which means the free association and the free transmission of the generative entities is critical because those generative entities come into us as new diverse populations of capabilities and they allow this to happen. There are metaphors for institutions with this, where the institutions and the free exchange of generativity could be viewed as the free exchange of people who work and create that institution. But if the norms diminish that free exchange, then we can look at forming, you know, basically the equivalent of a marrow biont in an institution. And most of our institutions are marrow biont. So that's what I'll cover in the next podcast. In the meantime, oh. I have to go to drink with a neighbor. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Like, this has been mind blowing, really, or mind expanding for sure. And I can't well, wait for the next recording. It. Like, seriously, I mean, it is something to digest upon. Um, but yeah, there's a transcript, people. So, if you want to read through what you just heard, um, oh, got a transcript, it's all accessible. Um, <laughs> and you can also rewind and listen again. But thanks so much for sharing this, Richard. I'm looking forward My to it. My pleasure, Joe. Thanks for, you know, for encouraging me to do this. And I look forward to the next one where I can start talking more about how the whole genome can give us insights that may allow us to come with a way forward. Okay? Sure. Looking okay. Forward. Thanks okay. again. And thanks to the listeners. And See ya. Bye. Bye.